Did you know that people who are truly in love with themselves naturally attract love from others? Why? Because when you're in harmony with yourself, you're in a state where you're not searching for flaws in others. Instead, you're drawn to the parts of them that resonate with you, that bring you joy. It's all about connection. And here's the magic. If you practice feeling just a little bit of love, a little gratitude, each day you start rewiring your internal state. I've got the research to back this up your immune system becomes more resilient. It literally transforms. 10 minutes, 20 minutes of sincere gratitude a day, not just thinking about what you're grateful for, but actually feeling it deep within changes everything. Why is this so powerful? Because gratitude is the ultimate state of receivership. Think about it when something wonderful happens, when you receive something unexpectedly good, what do you feel? grateful. That emotion is your body's way of acknowledging that something amazing is unfolding. So when you finish your meditation in a state of gratitude, even before the event happens, your body is already believing it's real. Your unconscious mind doesn't know the difference between a memory of the past and a vision of the future. If you're feeling grateful now, your body thinks it's already received. What do you have to lose? At worst, your immune system gets stronger and at best, you heal. That's the worst case scenario, you heal. But too often, people wake up and go right into their routine. And the first thing they do is think about their problems. Their brain is wired to replay the past because each problem is tied to memories, specific people, places, events. So the moment they think about their problems, they're already living in the past. Every one of those memories carries an emotion. And now, just like that, they're feeling unhappy. The brain fires off the thought and the body responds emotionally because thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body. So before they even get out of bed, they're back in their old familiar emotional state. And it's a loop. Thoughts create feelings and feelings create thoughts. If you're having an unhappy thought, your body responds by producing chemicals that make you feel unhappy. That's how the cycle goes. Thoughts, feelings, chemistry. The stronger the emotion tied to a problem or condition, the more attention we give it. If something in your life causes a significant emotional charge, it creates a lasting memory. Your brain captures that moment in vivid detail, like a snapshot. What most people don't realize is that every time they relive that memory, they're triggering the same emotional response in the body as if it's happening again. The body is so objective it doesn't know the difference between the real event and the memory of the event. So the body stays locked in the past, replaying the same emotional reactions. Here's the kicker. We start conditioning our body into these states of resentment, unhappiness, anxiety, whatever emotion we associate with those memories. And over time, it becomes a subconscious program. The body takes over. And now those emotions aren't just in the brain, they live in the body. The body becomes the mind. And what's happening? All all that energy you could use for growth, for creativity, is being consumed by survival. It's not the time to create, it's the time to run, fight, or hide. So the person stays stuck in that loop. Their body is living in the past, making them sick, and they don't even realize it. The thoughts are literally making them sick. To break free, you've got to step out of that familiar emotional state, that conditioning, and step into the unknown. You have to leave behind the emotions that have defined you and start creating something new. So when someone says, I can't feel joy, I can't feel love, what they're really expressing is that they've conditioned their body so deeply into the past, it can't feel anything other than the familiar survival emotions. The chemicals of stress and survival, those fight or flight hormones, have thrown the brain and body out of balance. And if this becomes habitual, that imbalance becomes the new normal and suddenly you're living in a state of emotional disarray. But what if you could shift that? What if you practiced being so present in the moment, so rooted in the now, that you stop anticipating the future or reliving the past? That's where the magic happens, the generous present moment. The familiar past is just that. It's the known, those emotional states you've experienced time and time again. The predictable future is living on autopilot, driven by unconscious programs, another known. But the present moment, that's the realm of the unknown, the place where real change begins. When you train your body to trust you, to feel safe enough, 
you transcend all those drives, the need to move, to eat, to respond to the world around you, and your body finally relaxes into the present moment. Now you're ready to create, and that's where you can work with your heart. Begin by breathing, by practicing feeling love or gratitude. At first, it might seem unnatural. You might think, why should I feel love if nothing's changed? That's the conditioning. You've been hypnotized to wait for your external world to shift before you allow yourself to feel. But here's the thing, your body being so objective doesn't know the difference between the emotion you're creating and the actual event. If you start feeling that gratitude, that love, as if it's happening right now, your body begins to believe that future is already unfolding. Your biology starts to shift in real time to align with that new reality. The stronger the emotion you feel inside, the more attention you give to the vision of your future. It's like flipping the script. You're no longer remembering your past. You're remembering your future. And when you're fully in the present moment, when you know what you want, you start teaching your body the emotional signature of that future. You practice opening your heart. It's fascinating what happens when this shift occurs. When the heart starts to move into a rhythmic coherence, when you're no longer frustrated, impatient, or resentful, the heart sends a powerful signal to the brain. It's like dropping a pebble in a pond, ripple after ripple. That coherent rhythm sends energy to the brain, altering your brain wave patterns. Suddenly you're in a state of creation, your brain shifting into alpha waves where the magic happens. In this state, you silence the critical inner voice, the one that's always telling you you're not good enough. When your heart is activated, when you're feeling love for your future, powerful chemicals like oxytocin are released in both the brain and heart. Oxytocin signals nitric oxide, which then triggers a chemical called endothelial-derived relaxing factor. Just like when you're physically aroused, your heart begins to expand, filling with energy, pumping rhythmically in perfect order. You're fully present, fully alive in the moment. If you're ever caught in that cycle of negative emotions and thoughts, here's what you do. Take a moment, close your eyes, and reconnect with the feelings of your future. When you feel those emotions ahead of the experience, you're conditioning your body to that future reality. The reason we close our eyes during meditation is that the external environment is too seductive. We sit still because our body will try to convince us to move, to eat, to engage with the world. But in that moment, you're the mind. You're teaching the body who's in charge, telling it to sit and stay. You don't get up from that meditation until you've conditioned your body into the emotions of your future, until you're so clear on who you will be that day. When you come up against your unconscious thoughts and they will come, you meet them head on. You've done the work, you've become so familiar with those thoughts that they can't slip past your awareness. You stay present, you stay conscious, and that's when true transformation happens. At the start of the day, you're essentially suppressing those old neural circuits in the brain, the ones that no longer fire and wire together. You're breaking down the old personality, the version of yourself that's stuck in the past. And here's where the work begins. Your body wants to get up. Maybe you feel the urge to go to the bathroom, grab a cup of coffee, check your phone, but instead you bring yourself back to the present moment over and over. Every time you do that, it's a victory. You're reclaiming your will, your free will, See, most people lose their free will to a program, repeating the same behaviors today as they did yesterday. Their body is on autopilot, dragging them through the same emotions, thoughts, and habits that recreate the same future. But when you sit in meditation and feel uncomfortable, and your body starts telling you it wants to quit, that's when you say, no, you get back here. You're not in control, I am. And each time you do that, you're winning. You're training your body to be present, not ruled by old habits. Some people say, I can't meditate. But really, when they're struggling, that's a sign they're doing it right. It's a victory to notice your body resisting, to see how it wants to revert to the familiar. Maybe it's telling you, hey, it's 8.30 a.m., we usually watch the news or get irritated about something right now. Your body is trying to create that familiar stress, trying to drag you back into old patterns. But if you catch it and say, no, I'm not giving my power away to the past, that's another win. You're telling your body it's no longer the mind. You are. Now, this process isn't easy in the beginning. It stretches your boundaries and forces you to step into the unknown. But the more you do it, the more relaxed you'll feel in that space of uncertainty. 
you start to feel a sense of satisfaction, of empowerment, and you're primed for creation. This is why the morning routine is so important. It's about reminding yourself of who you no longer want to be, becoming conscious of those unconscious programs that have been running your life. The word meditation means to become familiar with, and that's what you're doing. You're becoming so familiar with the old patterns that you refuse to go unconscious. You're battling that old personality, the one creating the same personal reality day after day. And if you want to create a new personal reality, you've got to change your personality. That means becoming so aware of those old programs that you stop being them. You become the consciousness observing them. Now, disentangling from those programs isn't easy. That's why most people won't do it. They'll reach for their phone, check for a text, get that quick hit of dopamine. But when you put the phone down, you're no longer relying on something outside of you to regulate your internal state. This is the real game. Once you've brought your attention to the present, you start asking, what thoughts do I want to fire and wire in my brain today? With your attention and intention, you begin to install a new program, one that's aligned with who you want to become. If you keep firing those thoughts, they'll eventually hardwire, turning into a software program that runs automatically. That's how you create a new personality, a new you. Here's the interesting thing. Why is it that some people can take a sugar pill, a saline injection, or undergo a sham surgery and still experience healing? They accept, believe, and surrender to the idea that they're receiving the real treatment without analyzing it, and their autonomic nervous system kicks in, creating the exact chemicals needed for healing. What does that tell us? It's not the external substance doing the healing. It's the power within, the connection between the mind and body. The placebo becomes a symbol of possibility. When a person believes that pill can help them, it opens the door to hope. In studies on depression, for example, up to 75% of people taking a placebo get better. That's because the pill represents hope or a new future. And with that comes a shift in thinking. They begin to focus on the possibility that they can feel better. That's the power of intention combined with an elevated emotion. When someone consistently believes in their potential to heal day after day, they're not just hoping for change. They're creating it. They're programming their body to align with a new future. The pill itself is just a symbol, a representation of possibility, but the real work is done internally through their belief, their thoughts, and their emotions. In a study on depression, we begin to see how emotions become the language of our thinking. And through that, people are literally changing their biology just by thought alone. What happens when we repeatedly experience the same emotions and think the same thoughts? It starts to change the body's chemistry, altering the nervous system, and triggering new biological responses. The nervous system is, without a doubt, the most powerful pharmacy on the planet, producing exactly the chemicals we need to adapt. And if you keep engaging in that process, knocking on the door of your genes, you can upregulate or downregulate genes, instructing your biology to change accordingly. That's what's happening with the placebo effect. Effect. My question has always been, if you understand how the placebo works, can you teach it? Do you really need a sugar pill to change your state of being? Or can you learn how to choose an unknown future, repeatedly selecting it and emotionally embracing it before it even happens? The key is to make your body, the unconscious mind, believe it's already living in that future reality, in the present moment. Now, when someone takes a placebo for six weeks, they're not just passively hoping for change. They're altering their biology every single day. The question becomes, can we make that unknown future a known reality and shift our physiology just through thought? Absolutely. But here's the thing, it's not about wishful thinking. This is about creating such a strong impression in your biology, backed by experience, that your body changes. Your cells start to align with that new belief, but the journey doesn't end there. After that shift, you've got to ask yourself, what's the next belief that will take me even further? What new understanding can I adopt to continue evolving? For example, let's talk about a woman who has gone through a really challenging marriage. Her husband was abusive and for years she lived in stress constantly in survival mode. Her energy was always focused on external threats, leaving none for internal healing or growth. She developed allergies, her body became hypersensitive to her environment. Then she comes to one of our events. She does the work for three months, consistently stepping into the unknown, and suddenly she has a breakthrough. In one moment, her body transforms and she can eat foods she's been allergic to for years. What changed? 
she stopped identifying with her past. No longer was she saying, I am this way because of my marriage. Because you see, when you say, I'm this way because of what happened to me, you're acknowledging that emotionally you haven't changed since that event. You're projecting your past into your future. When you release the emotional charge of that memory, what you're left with is wisdom. And when you've gained that wisdom, you're free to create a new future. This woman no longer feels the anxiety she once did, and as a result, her biology reorganized to match her new mind. I watched her eat pizza, burgers, things she couldn't touch before, and it wasn't a fleeting change. It lasted. But that's not the final chapter. Once she healed herself, the next question became, if I can heal myself, can I heal others? This is how the process continues to unfold. One belief leads to another and we expand our understanding of what's possible. Now let's consider another common belief, something like astrology, where people believe their fate is tied to the stars. Some people are convinced that their astrological sign dictates their destiny. And because they believe that, they look for evidence in their reality to support it. They notice 1111 on the clock and they attach meaning to it while ignoring all the other times they see 236 or 418. Their attention is focused on what supports their belief system. I don't personally subscribe to that idea, but I respect it. That belief works for them, and they'll hold on to it until it no longer serves them. At that point, they'll either evolve beyond it or remain where they are, and that's okay. But if they do choose to evolve, they'll realize that it wasn't the stars determining their future, it was their own beliefs. I myself have beliefs that I'm still questioning, beliefs that I know are limiting, but in order to change them, I have to step out of my comfort zone into the unknown. I have to test new possibilities in a very different way. That's what it takes to grow. And I can tell you there's a strong majority of people who are still using the power of the placebo effect to transform their lives. They're not just waiting for change, they're creating it. Through consistent thought and feeling, they're making profound shifts in their biology and their reality.